The Shape of Evolution. I ran into a, uh, an article that says, Scientific study turns understanding about evolution on its head. I think that's interesting. It's in uh, physics.org, and it's available on the internet if, if you want to look at it yourself, and um, we'll be quoting most of it. Uh, July 30, 2013. Um, and it starts out with a subtitle, Our understanding of how animals on the planet evolved may be wrong, according to scientists at the university. I think it's the University of Leeds. It's one in England, anyway. Um, unfortunately, in the paper, it didn't say you have to click the link to get to it. Oh, no, it's not Leeds. It's Bath. Um, in a new paper recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So this is peer-reviewed literature and therefore must be correct. Um, evolutionary biologists from the Department of Biology and Biochemistry looked at nearly 100 fossil groups to test the notion that it takes groups of animals many millions of years to reach their maximum diversity of form. Um, you will notice that the traditional model is a cone which gradually becomes more and more diverse. Um, sorry for the university, I'll take that out later. Contrary to popular belief, not all animal groups continue to evolve fundamentally new morphologies through time. The majority actually achieve their greatest diversity of form or disparity relatively early in their histories. A lead researcher from the Department of Biology and Biochemistry, Dr. Matthew Wills, said, this pattern known as early high disparity turns the traditional V-shaped cone model of evolution on its head. What is equally surprising in our findings is that groups of animals are likely to show early high disparity regardless of when they originated over the past half a billion years. This isn't a phenomenon particularly associated with the first radiation of animals, i.e. the Cambrian explosion, or periods in the immediate wake of mass extinctions. It happens everywhere. The team used published descriptions of extinct groups in order to construct morphospaces, empirical spaces in which anatomically similar species plotted close together and more dissimilar species plotted further apart. By looking at the manner in which the occupied volume of space changed through time, they were able to track changes in morphological disparity. Author Martin Hughes continued, our work implies that there must be constraints on the range of forms within animal groups and that these limits are often hit relatively early on. The only exceptions to the rule are groups that were wiped out at times of mass extinction. These groups tended to be, have flat-topped and hop-heavy evolutionary trajectories overall, which is kind of understanding. If you have any kind of a group and you simply cut it off, then it tends to be expanding. And by the way, the same thing is true for recent species. That is, the present is an effective cutoff as well. University co-author Dr. Sylvia, Sylvain Gerber added, a key question now is what prevents groups from generating fundamentally new forms later on in their evolution? Equally intriguing is the manner in which some groups are able to break free from these constraints. Our, and, and when they do, they break free suddenly. Our results hint that this may hinge upon the evolution of new key innovations that enable groups to exploit new resources or habitats, for example, dinosaurs growing feathers and evolving wings, or fish evolving legs and moving on to land to claim new territory. That's their perspective on it. Um, so we go to the paper itself, which, by the way, is also available online, so you can check what's being given. Um, and the author affiliations are the Department of Biology and Biochemistry, University of Bath in the United Kingdom. So, and the title is Clades Reach Highest Morphological Disparity Early 
in their evolution. The abstract reads, there are two slides, there are a few putative macroevolutionary trends or rules that withstand scrutiny. Here we test and verify the purported, think about that, evolution is, is a theory, but it doesn't really have any data or very little data. Here we test and verify the purported tendency for animal clades to reach their maximum morphological variety relatively early in their evolutionary histories that is to say, early high disparity. We present a meta-analysis of 98 metazoan clades radiating through the Phanerozoic. The disparity profiles of groups through time are summarized in terms of their center of gravity. That's to say, how many different kinds of uh, species you find and a center of gravity obviously less than 0.5 of the range means that there's more disparity at the beginning and less disparity at the end. With values above and below 0 0.50 including indicating top and bottom heaviness respectively. The higher the center of gravity, the more disparity towards the end. And if you're looking at that cone, that should be quite a bit above a 0.5. Clades that terminate at one of the big five mass extinction events tend to have truncated tra trajectories with a significantly top-heavy center of gravity distribution overall. The remaining 63 clades show the opposite tendency with a significantly bottom-heavy mean CG that is to say, relatively high, early high disparity. Resampling tests are used to identify groups with the center of gravity significantly above or below 0 0.50. Clades not terminating at a mass extinction are three times more likely to be significantly bottom heavy than top heavy. So if you don't do anything to the distribution, it's bottom heavy. Overall, there's no clear temporal trend in disparity profile shapes from the Cambrian to the recent. They all look the same. And early high disparity is the predominant pattern throughout the Phanerozoic. Our results do not allow us to distinguish between ecological and developmental explanations for this phenomenon. Why is it happening? Because it's not what was expected. They can't say. To the extent that ecology has a role, however, the paucity of bottom-heavy clades radiating in the immediate wake of mass extinctions suggests that early high disparity more probably results from evolution of key epimorphies at the base of clades rather than from physical drivers or catastrophic ecospace clearing. Or to quote Richard Dawkins, it's just as if they were planted there. Evolution is usually characterized as an essentially contingent and unpredictable process, which means it doesn't have any empirical content, or very little. This makes it very difficult to identify general rules comparable to those that typify the other natural sciences. Notice evolution is different from all the other natural scientists. Completely different. Nonetheless, the prospect of formulating and testing macroevolutionary generalities is extremely seductive because they seem to offer fundamental insights into the manner in which evolutionary processes operate throughout Earth's history. We'd like to have rules, we just don't have them. Patterns of increasing diversity measured via proxies of species richness, three and four, an increased maximal organismal size within clades, Cope's rule, have been perennial foci, whereas the more recent attention has turned to supposed trends in increasing organismal complexity and the mechanisms that might generate them. This paper tests another putative generality, namely the tendency for taxa to reach maximum morphological diversity, disparity, 
relatively early in the lifespan of their parent clade. It's basically restating what they have stated already. Disparity is conceptually and empirically distinct from diversity. For example, a relatively small sample of species that differ greatly from one another morphologically, for example, one species from each order of insects, is likely to be more disparate than a much larger sample of species that are morphologically more homogeneous. For example, a thousand beetles of perhaps different subspecies or different species, but not different genuses. Among the first questions to be addressed using disparity indices was the perceived magnitude of the Cambrian explosion. I want you to notice that if you hear people telling you that there was no Cambrian explosion, that that's just a figure of speech, these people feel quite comfortable using it. From Charles Darwin onward, evolutionary biologists have been perplexed by the apparently instantaneous first appearance of numerous phyla, a highly disparate sample of species in the Cambrian fossil record. So those who complain that, Darwin is, uh, that uh, Steve Meyer was exaggerating Darwin's doubt, no, he wasn't. Everybody really knows this. The subsequent discovery of hitherto unknown fossil groups from the Cambrian Burgess Sale and similar localities added to the enigma, prompting the radical hypothesis that the disparity of metazoans peaked in the Cambrian and subsequent extinctions winnowed this down to much more modest levels soon thereafter. Surprisingly, a relatively small number of studies have tested this hypothesis directly in focal clades. These predominantly conclude that Cambrian animals groups had a disparity comparable to that of their modern counterparts. This looks like an orchard. It does not look like a cone, like a tree. This nonetheless suggests that metazoans reached high levels of disparity relatively early in their history, the phenomenon of early high disparity. Unfortunately, such analyses are limited for two reasons. First, they discount the intervening trajectory of clade evolution. Second, the clade history is truncated both by the present and by a Precambrian fossil record that is en en enigmatic at best. In other words, there isn't anything down there, or very little. It's a few sponges. Um, as a result, the focus on disparity studies has increasingly turned to clades that both originate and go extinct within the Phanerozoic. Once again, there is a purported tendency for clades to evolve their most disparate forms relatively early in their histories. However, the validity of this early high disparity model has never been tested systematically. If true, it represents a general macroevolutionary rule on the broadest possible scale and is comparable to those proposed for increasing morphological complexity and increasing maximal organismal size within clades. Unfortunately, it is impossible to interpret published case studies meta-analytically for several reasons. First, the type of data used is highly variable, outlines, landmarks, and discrete characters, as is the information that these data are intended to convey, shape, form, or homologous characters of the entire organism or particular organ systems. So this is a messy study to do. Second, the manner in which these data have been analyzed is equally variable, although most studies implement some, for of, some form of data reduction and ordination. Species are typically plotted within an empirical multidimensional space defined by morphological variables, that is amorphous space. Third, there are many possible indices of morphological disparity, and these are known to describe different aspects of morphospace space occupation. Fourth, the manner in which trajectories of disparity through time are qu quantified and classified is also variable. Several of the analysis that originally spurred the debate uh, used discrete character matrices to compare anatomically very disparate forms. 
Many studies have recently followed similar protocols, um, and we adopted these methods here as a unifying approach, where discrete and continuous character data have been compared for the same set of taxa, relative estimates of disparity have been similar. Now, by the way, uh, in case you're looking at this, that arrow, I think, if you click on it, you get to 22 in the original text. Um, uh, you'll see whenever there's, uh, uh, whenever there are more than one, that there will be down arrows. I'm not sure quite how they did that or why they did that, but uh, I think that's so that you can go re directly to reference 37 if you want to. We collated morphological and stratigraphic data for 98 extinct and relict clades to answer these questions. One, three questions. One, is early high disparity the dominant pattern of clade evolution across the Metazoa and throughout the Phanerozoic? Is it really true that these things are bottom heavy as the Gould method would, would indicate? That has obviously a very low center of gravity. Um, is there a trade in clade disparity profile shape through the, throughout the Phanerozoic? And number three, do clades terminating at times of mass extinction have disparity profile shapes distinguishable from clades becoming extinct at other times? We addressed all three questions using the clade center of gravity. Was, uh, well, the, the question two is basically, is the Cambrian explosion unique or is that the general pattern? In which case you're starting to think, do you really want to call this evolution? Because it looks like everything started at once. The, this quantifies overall clade shape in a robust manner and has been previous has previously been applied to paleontological diversity and disparity data. Values of the center of gravity less than 0.5 denote bottom heavy clades, whereas the center of gravity greater than 0.5 denotes top heaviness. We considered extinct and some relict clades in our samples because clades with extant lineages are still evolving and may be at or still approaching their maximum disparity. Extant clades are more likely to have flat top disparity profiles, which will artificially shift their center of gravity upward relative to that which may have pertained for the hypothetical entire clade history. However, clades terminating at a mass extinction event might be similarly truncated and are likely to have higher center of gravities for sim similar reasons. Mass extinctions have undoubtedly influenced the manner in which clades have explored morphospaces, but this phenomenon received little attention until recently. Moreover, only one of these studies, you see here you can see three arrows, 43, 44, 45, 46, and then 47. Um, one of these uh, studies focused on extinction selectivity per se, all others investigated the subsequent evolution of extinction survivors. Here we determined whether the clades going extinct coincided with one of the big five mass extinction events, that is at the end of the Ordovician and in the late Devonian, not quite at the end, the um, end Permian, the end Triassic, and the one that most of you know the most, which is the end Cretaceous, when the dinosaurs all died out. They had uh, disparity profiles distinguishable from those terminating at other times. And here's an example of a somewhat typical disparity profile. And this is just simply the number of, uh, or the, the range, let's say, of different uh, body types. And you'll see that almost all of the basic body types are right there at the beginning that you have a few of them here and this one dies out. And so at this point, you're actually lower. And then when you get up to here, there's only two of them and so it's lower still. And presumably when one of these two areas dies out, then it drops into a more or less single point. 
It's not quite the Gould model, but you can see it's clearly more bottom heavy than top heavy. Um, and th this is uh, calculating the disparity profile of clades, and uh, uh, they're measured as the sum of variances on six successive principal coordinate analysis at several time intervals. And, uh, and they've basically, they've done some computer uh, reruns taking different areas as being the kind of the model area. And uh, the distribution of tax on the first two principal coordinates of their empirical morphospace space at three of the time intervals and the black uh, symbols actually with that, with the variances, you could do 20 of them at, at the same time if you wanted to. Um, uh, black symbols indicate tax are present in their interval. And that, those are just the uh, ones that I pointed out to you. Um, stylized representation of significantly top heavy and bottom heavy asymmetrical uh, clade. Uh, let me just, uh, yeah. Here's a, what a top heavy should look like. Cone shaped, right? Here's what a bottom heavy one should look like. And by the way, there are ones that are centric. And we're going to see a few of those. And in just a bit, we're going to take a look at them. Uh, results and discussion. For diversity through time, random birth and death models with constant parameters predict that the average clade shape should be symmetrical. However, for disparity, the predictions are less precise. Remember, diversity is just period how many different. I would think that the average clade shape should be uh, uh, should be uh, top heavy, but. Uh, Disparity, the predictions are less precise. So this is the standard evolutionary model, and this is what we're looking at now. New species can only arise from the fission of existing ones. Clades initially diversify from a single species and therefore a single point in the morphospace, whereas extinctions can be random with respect to the same tree. Therefore, if a clade follows a homogeneous birth-death model with characters evolving in a Brownian fashion, that is, random evolutionary like we're always taught it's supposed to work. Some top heaviness would be expected. So we maybe not a perfect cone, but in general, we would expect a, a cone, an upside down cone shape. Our use of 0 0.5 as a null is slightly simplistic. Probably should be higher than that therefore, but biased against our principal finding. So this is the, uh, shall we call it the best case scenario. Sure. Would be, some top heaviness would be expected. Wouldn't you expect it in all? Well, yeah, actually you kind of would, except that maybe if species die out with time and then everything kind of shrinks down. But you'd still, until all but one species die out, you should still have quite a bit of uh, disparity. You might have uh, one or two of them, but if evolution is proceeding, these should all increase. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, standard evolutionary theory would suggest that as, as time goes on, the disparity should increase along with the diversity. So, like I say, this model is actually, if they're, if they're drawing the line at 0.5, they're actually being kind to the standard model. The standard model should be expecting to see 0.6, 0.8, uh, probably more like 0.9. I would say that a lot of top heaviness would be expected. Yeah. Well, let's see, if you have a perfect cone, um, the center of gravity of a cone, I'd have to do some calculation, but I think it's like about 0.75 or something like that. So, uh, you know, because of the way they're measuring stuff, it doesn't go to 100%. But it's, it's still, you expect the, uh, 
you expect the disparity to be small at the beginning. Our use of 0.5 as a null is slightly simplistic, therefore, but biased against our principal finding, namely that clades not terminating in a mass extinction event are bottom heavy on average. Across our sample of 98 clades, including those terminating coincident with a mass extinction, we found a mean disparity of profile of uh, 0.495 with a median CG of 0.501, indistinguishable from 0.5. Uh, probability is 0.992, which, you know, if you're going to make it statistically significant, it should be less than 0.5. Uh, time averaged indices mask some apparent differences in clade disparity profiles within and between eras. Most notably, there were more bottom heavy clades in the late Paleozoic than top heavy clades, with the opposite pattern in the Mesozoic. So there was a little bit ch of change there. However, comparison across four time bins, early Paleozoic, late Paleozoic, um, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, revealed no significant differences in the frequencies. Log likelihood ratio test uh, uh, is uh, P is 0.513. We then implemented a bootstrapping test for a significant deviation from clade symmetry allowing us to partition clades into three groups, significantly bottom-heavy, significantly top-heavy, and indistinguishable from symmetrical, which we discounted. I want to come back to that when we're um, thinking about what a creationist would do. Again, there were no significant differences in the relative frequencies of significantly bo top and bottom-heavy clades across the four time bins. Finally, a plot of clade... Uh, 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 center of gravity against the time of clade origin revealed no, no systemic trends throughout the, the Phanerozoic. And here's figure two, and you can see that really looks like the average stays about the same all the way through. If you want to argue, you could argue that there's a little bit of a dip there in the middle, but not much. And this point here is 0 0.5, which is the no difference that's neither bottom nor top heavy. Um, center of gravity values for all 98 data sets across the Phanerozoic, and um, that gives you the, you know, they're talking about all of those things that they put in. You can read the, uh, study the, uh, uh, the legend to the uh, figure if you uh, later if you want uh, and basically um, you know it's all about the same although clay disparity profiles had a mean center of gravity indistinguishable from 0 0.5 there was a marked and significant difference in clay in center of gravity between those clades terminating coincident with a mass extinction event and those becoming extinct at other times the latter group had significantly bottom-heavy disparity profiles on average, 63 clades with a mean center of gravity significantly less than uh, 0 0.5. With their t-test, it's 0 0.01. This is unlikely to have happened by chance. Not origin of life unlikely, but, but, but paper-producing unlikely. By contrast, the 35 clades ending at mass extinctions had a mean center of gravity significantly greater than 0 0.5, which you'll notice uh, that the probability there is uh, less than 0 0.001. That's one in a thousand. Likelihood ratio tests also confirmed that the relative frequencies of top and bottom heavy clades terminating at mass extinctions and at other times were different whether including all clades or only those with significant skew. That is, the ones that are close enough to 0 0.5 to where you really couldn't tell the difference very well, if you excluded those, it was still 
uh, actually, it was more improbable. Um, goes, the probability goes from 0 0.006 to 0 0.001. If you exclude the, the, the ones that are really close and, you know, maybe it's 0 0.499 and the other one is 0 0.501 and you kind of just exclude those. For comparison, we also generated disparity profiles for 53 additional living clades with high diversity in the recent. Um, these extant clades truncated by the present had a medium center of gravity significantly greater than 0 .0, 0 0.500, but indistinguishable from that for fossil clades terminating at a mass extinction event. So the present basically behaves the same as having everything wiped out, which, by the way, would be the case if we were to have nuclear war. And here you can see a lot of them that really didn't make too much difference, um, whereas, you know, if it's not ending at a, ma a mass extinction event, it's probably going to be bottom heavy rather than top heavy, whereas if it e ended at a mass extinction event, it's probably going to be top heavy. And of course, the present is very similar to the e extinct groups that were wiped out apparently by a mass extinction event. And uh, that's the uh, legend for the figure. And you can, again, I'll those of you who want to, to read it and study it online. Over half of our study clades had disparity profiles that were neither significantly top nor bottom heavy. However, these symmetrical, uh, these are important. These symmetrical clades may nonetheless have a variety of trajectories with their own particular macroevolutionary implications. Most remarkable are groups, for example, crino crinoids, whose earlier earliest exemplars have levels of disparity that are not significantly different from the maximum levels subsequently achieved by the clade. This is perfect orchard behavior. A simplistic null of early maximal disparity. For 29 of the 54 symmetrical groups, we were unable to reject this null. Such a pattern would be close to that often visions for explosive radiations and similar to that proposed as a trajectory for metazoans through the Phanerozoic. Early high patterns inevitably imply an unsampled period of cladogenesis. Do they really? Well, if you are stuck on an evolutionary mode, then of course they do, because you had to have them diverge, and you can't have them diverge instantly at the same time. That's just too much chance or the existence of ghost ranges, that is, ranges where they were there but just not shown, at the base of the clade. But this either occurs too fast for the available stratigraphic resolution or is not fossilized. In other words, we know what it ought to be, but it's not there. Late saturation is much less remarkable because clades have already undergone radiation and diversification and had almost the entirety of their histories in which to colonize the extremities of their morphospaces. Although late saturation was observed in 32 symmetrical clades, 12 of these also ended at a mass extinction and were therefore likely to have been prematurely truncated. For this reason, we again focused on the 63 free evolving clades that did not terminate at a mass extinction. Of these, the proportion, two-thirds, that were either significantly bottom-heavy or showed early saturation to mutually compatible conceptions of early high disparity was significantly greater than the proportion that were either significantly top-heavy or showed late saturation, uh, late high disparity. The two-sample test gives you a probability of, about, uh, of less than one in uh, uh, 50. Therefore, clades that do not terminate at a mass extinction do indeed tend to reach their highest level of disparity relatively earlier in their evolutionary histories. Moreover, this tendency occurs throughout the Phanerozoic, <coughs> through everywhere. So the Gould model is better 
than the standard evolutionary model for those. But there are these kind of barrel shaped, which be, uh, kind of start at the bottom and stay more or less the same, <coughs> maybe a little expansion, and from the sound of it, maybe a little contraction sometimes. So you might have a reverse of that barrel. Why do clades have early high disparity? Well, this does not fit the standard evolutionary model. So what might explain the prevailing pattern of early high disparity in clade evolution? Both ecological and developmental explanations have been proposed, and our results remain consistent with both. The empty ecospace model predicts that clades will radiate and diversify much more rapidly when colonizing a new environment. <coughs> this colonization may occur because ecospace has been vacated by other occupants, for example, in the wake of some other extinction, typically the result of external physical factors, such as a, uh, an asteroid uh, hitting the Yucatan, for example, maybe. Um, or because a hitherto inaccessible environment or other resource has been rendered viable by the acquisition of some novel key adaptation or series of characters, an intrinsic biological tri trigger. Morphological changes under these circumstances may be rapid either because transitions are unusually large or because rates of cladogenesis are unusually high, even with normal step sizes at each splitting event. So maybe there's just, you can go anywhere, you can do anything, and so animals just do that. And the, now think of it, remember this is how it must have happened and therefore we must have had early rapid evolution because everybody knows that evolution happened and this can't be just an orchard planted as if they were planted. In this context, we also note that major clades are often distinguished from their paraphyletic progenitors because they possess distinct and dis defining sets of derived characters, or because an extant crown is defined relative to an extant stem. These divisions, that is to say, birds, which is supposed to be a crown, are derived from dinosaurs, which is supposed to be a stem. What's the definition of a stem? Well, it means that you can go from it to something else. That's all it means. And if and if you didn't know that birds uh, came from dinosaurs, birds would be a stem gr uh, crown group, and so would dinosaurs. The distinction between stem and crown is entirely dependent upon evolutionary theory. These divisions into a clade and its residual paraphylum would otherwise uh, often be arbitrary. Whoa, you see, if you take evolution out, they are arbitrary. For example, rather than delimiting a clade of aves from within the paraphyletic non-avian dinosaurs, it would be possible to define a clade of aves plus some arbitrary depth of theropod dinosaurs. <coughs> However, birds are defined in the manner they are because they acquired a distinctive suite of apomorphies pertaining to the evolution of flight. Not just wings, but also hollow bones, respiratory systems that are one way instead of two way, and all kinds of other ad adaptations that are useful for flight. So it's not just wings. Keep that in mind. Um, because if it were just wings, then, and then pterodons would be birds. key innovations in this case that off also enabled them to exploit a new environment. These shifts in anatomy, physiology, behavior, and ecology may themselves explain the differential survival of crowns and stems. More generally, it is likely that global shifts in climate, sea ch level, and ocean chemistry, coupled with the elevated rates of extinction and turnover that these phenomena engender, affected the availability of ecospace throughout the Phanerozoic. The environment's always changing. Sort of like climate is always changing, but I digress. Um, the only temporal pattern in disparity profile shapes detected in our data was a significant tendency towards top heaviness in those clades terminating coincident with mass extinction, which predominantly results from physical drivers. 
However, mass extinctions need not increase the subsequent availability of ecospace, but may actually cause its collapse. The absence of any systemic trends in clade disparity patterns through times, or of any increased propensity for early high disparity in clades radiating in the immediate wake of mass extinctions, suggests that if ecological mechanisms have a role, then it is much more likely to be mediated by key innovations, which can evolve at any time, and the, op and the opening up of new adaptive zones rather than from ecospace clearing. So it's not like you wipe everything out in the Permian and now new organisms can find a niche. It's that the organisms finally figure out how to make wings and so they do all kinds of different uh, things and then, um, and then you have an explosive radiation. Now again, this is evolution dependent. If you're a creationist, uh, if you're a long-age creationist, you would say that God created a whole bunch of things at once. All the birds at about the same time. Uh, what would do with it as a short creationist, uh, uh, I will leave to the discussion. We stress that ecological and developmental explanations for early high disparity are not mutually exclusive. Neither do our results show us to, uh, allow us to distinguish between them. The hypothesis of increasing development constraints predicts that the increasing complexity and interdependence of ontogenic processes with evolutionary time effectively lock down the potential for s subsequent morphological innovation. You have an orchard. And then from then on, everything stays in the same general well, there's a little diversity as you go further, but not that much. Such mechanisms purportedly explain why body plans become invariant and inflexible with time. Well, maybe they were invariant and inflexible the whole time, and they were just planted there. As Dawkins says, it looks like. Although mechanisms by which these constraints may be lifted have been posited, do we know? Well, they've got to be because evolution <laughs> happened and it must have happened somehow. You see how so much of this is taking the fossil record and trying to jam it into evolutionary theory. Notable examples are the tetrapod pentadactyl limb. Early tetrapods explored a range of higher digit numbers the seven cervical vertebra of all mammals except sloths and manatees. Uh, for what it's worth, some sloths have six, some sloths have eight, and they apparently have some abnormalities when they do that, as do humans who have uh, uh, cervical ribs. They interfere with, uh, they, they wind up having to be taken out some of the time. Um, um, but apparently sloths are so lazy that it doesn't really make too much difference, and so they just hang there in the trees. Uh, manatees, interestingly enough, dugongs, which are very closely you know, related in terms of their physiology and stuff, um, don't seem to have the same uh, things as manatees. And apparently the manatees have problems with the, the fact that they have too few cervical ribs. Or, pardon me, too few cervical vertebrae. Anyway, but it's otherwise invariant. Mice have the same seven cervical vertebrae as giraffes do, as people do, horses, you name it, they've got it. And the diagnostic head segmentation of arthropod subphyla. Cambrian genera explored numerous alternatives with relative freedom. And then it, it got frozen after that. Such body patterning characters are usually controlled by Hox or homeobox genes, which are also frequently ad accepted from other, often functionally and positionally unrelated, developmental roles. P pardon me, for other developmental roles. So Hox genes are reused in an entirely different way. This increasing pleiotropy, that is more and more varied roles for the same regulatory genes, may account for the observed reduction of developmental ability. 
once it gets ossified, it doesn't move from there. Testing this hypothesis would require detailed ontogenic data far beyond the scope of this study. <coughs> the prevalence of early high disparity as a dominant pattern of clade evolution ranks alongside the well-known tendencies for increasing complexity and diversity underpinning putative macroevolutionary trends on the, of the widest possible generality. Moreover, it seems to apply throughout the Phanerozoic and not merely at times of global diversification. Now I'm going to stop there. There's uh, methods and materials and stuff like that that probably aren't that interesting. Um, my take on this is it appears statistically provable that there are more clades whose disparity tapers down from earlier to later strata than the more evolutionarily understandable reverse. That is, the fossil record doesn't look like evolution. There are also significant numbers of clades which do not taper either way, which is also more consistent with an orchard pattern than a tree-like pattern. In fact, I'm going to suggest that that one that doesn't taper either way is what you would expect from a flood. To an unbiased observer, or even some biased ones, such as the people who wrote this paper, the fossil record does not bear out the predictions of evolutionary theory. This is not, of course, what is portrayed in the media or in most textbooks. Perhaps the overwhelming evidence of evolution isn't quite so overwhelming after all. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. We have a comment over here, and a comment over here, and one here. Okay. So. I'm oh, just thinking it would be nice to have explained in layman's terms what, how they are trying in this paper, how they're trying to explain the anomaly that they're finding that does not really fit with evolution because I just get lost in all those figures and et cetera, et cetera. Well, there, okay, there's, there's two things that are going on in this paper. One of them is showing that what the fossil record actually shows is that instead of having one species and then two closely related species and then two further related species and then two closely related species with some more species coming out here and uh, you, you expect this to be um, what's traditionally been called a tree but it's really more like a cone you know I mean trees have branches that go down as well so it's more like a computer tree, if you want to call it that. It, it's, uh, it's branching. That's what you expect, with maybe some branches getting clipped off here and there. So that, but, but you expect the top branches to be further apart than you do the bottom branches. You expect them to be close together. But what you actually see, and you saw that in that, uh, when they showed those, um, that kind of lobster-like creature that they were showing that what you actually see is you have a, there is a bottom layer so to speak and right at or very close to the bottom layer you have species over here species over here species over here and then as they go up they perhaps branch a little bit some of them get clipped off um, and so the effect is actually the most disparity is at the bottom and then as some of the species die out or are no longer recorded, however that works, that, uh, that you have a contracture at the top. And see, the difference between this cone shape, which is what evolution would predict, and this bottom heavy thing, it's not quite as bad as Stephen Jay Gould had it. But it's close. What I'd like to know is what those people, I, I get that part. Explain how that? are they explaining in this paper, because I don't follow it too well, how are they explaining how are they it explaining? away well, basically, to fit with evolution? 
basically so. what they do is they draw they have they have the base layer and they have to connect them all so what they've done is they've drawn dotted lines that eventually come down to a single ancestor the dotted lines are are uh, what the computer people would call vaporware <laughs> they don't exist uh, well, uh, they're, they're saying there must have been yeah. a, a, a divergence at the beginning. It must have been rapid, which of course is not the way evolution is usually portrayed. You know, slow, gradual changes. It's basically mm -hmm. it's saltation. Uh, and 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 what they're saying is, well, there you know there must have been some branches that went there, and they just haven't been fossilized for. Maybe they weren't making fossils or something. So it's a, it's a difficulty that they have explaining it. And, you know, if, if you insist on having, if you insist on having actual data to support that, well, you're just too picky. <laughs> yes, okay. and then here. All right. I thought it was a great study, and it increases my faith. Uh, I'm sure that this will be either ignored or, or considered an anomaly uh, in the future by the scientific community. My question is, however, in regard to these different, are we talking about eras? Are we talking about, where did they get the fossil samples, like in the Cambrian Lake? And yeah. How did they? Uh, yeah, the early Cambrian, late Cambrian. So if they go in the Grand Canyon, the lower Solarian. levels are going to be the more primitive, and and they're they're going up that way, or. Well, how, what how they're saying is that the lower levels are more disparate. That you can find ones that look like this, ones that look like that, ones that look like that, and then as you go further, they die out. <laughs> and of course, if you put time with that, that means that you have more disparity at the beginning than you do at the end. The, the lobsters that are at the bottom don't all look like one. They look like three or four different ones that are, that, that are different from each other enough to where it actually looks like they start uh, as disparate as they can. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, and then we'll have a comment here. Uh, many very interesting things here. Uh, just uh, to clarify, about how many of his, uh, what proportion of the group was top heavy? Well, if I'm reading the graph, because they didn't actually say in the text, I would say that about half of them were. That is a major group to. Uh, leave out from your main conclusion, isn't it? Well, yeah, but when you realize that the standard prediction should be that 98% of them should be top heavy, this, you know, this really doesn't work very well. And the, the interesting thing of it is that the, the top heavy ones are either ones that abut against the present and therefore can't diverge any further, or ones that abut against, say, the Permian okay. extinction, and therefore can't diverge anymore either. Oh, and what proportion is the extinction group? Well, the thing I think is interesting is those ones that are in the middle, that the center of gravity is right in their center. Hmm. And the reason I say that is because from a flood model creationist, I expect barrel shapes. That is to say, they all start with disparity, they keep going up, and then they, when they end, they'll end with disparity. And so what I expect <coughs> is a center of gravity about 0.5. I actually don't expect things to have big diversity at the bottom and, and, and narrowing at the top. Yeah, I So I'm actually kind of happy with all those ones that, that you know, that are 0 0.49, 0 0.51. Um, I, of course, uh, immediately try and fit some of this into a flood model. Mm-hmm. 
and I would uh, raise the question, you know, why are the, uh, where there's extinction, uh, and these folks steered clear of ecology. Right. Uh, well, they actually uh, mentioned it at one point. Yeah, no, they, they animals that animals that mm -hmm. suddenly got onto land uh, populated the area. The thing I find it fascinating is they populate land, and then uh, they populate it in all their different mm -hmm. forms at the beginning, or most of them. Yeah, well, this is, of course... A, uh, Which is a good creationist model. Along with the Cambrian explosion and... Uh, along, along with the Cambrian with, explosion. Along with the arrival of all the birds, or yeah. uh, bird types and so yeah. on. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, some of their extinctions might not fit with ecology. Uh, you uh, know, sort of a, a, a modified uh, ecological zonation kind of theory. Yeah, that's where I'm moving into uh, where you have, uh, you know, a, a distinct environment when you come, if you're going up through the layers from marine to, to land. Uh, and you have, uh, well, we notice that when we go heat, uh, reach... Uh, the tree level, for instance, uh, it'll go up mountains, the tree level, uh, and so on. We have an altitudinal uh, yeah. distribution and many subdivisions of that, <coughs> uh, where you have certain kinds of trees in one level and uh, fir trees higher up than uh, broad leaves and so on. Uh, if this uh, is extinctions, uh, might not... Uh, be exactly that type of thing. Uh, one in, reference was made once there to Cope's rule, uh -huh. which uh, to me... Uh, the larger animals are, get buried later. And you have to keep in mind, Cope worked with dinosaurs mainly. I mean, awful, at least uh, his battle with Marsh was uh, over dinosaurs and so yeah. on. And he developed this rule that uh, the higher you go up in the uh, genome, the larger the organisms are because they have evolved larger and larger. Yeah, and forms. it works for horses. And it uh, works for camels. It works and, for uh, all kinds of animals. You've got it in some dinosaurs. You've got it in dinosaurs. The interesting <laughs> thing about Cope's rule is that it would also work for a flood, where Perhaps. the little ones tend to sink faster uh, than the bigger ones well, finally come uh, down. Well, and. Uh, the bigger ones might have more energy to escape to higher levels than their smaller counterparts. Yeah, but teflonomy uh, would do it too. To, to, uh, the so, bigger ones have more, more uh, rotting uh, uh, flesh to keep the bones afloat. So the, there are factors here that, that fit nicely with a flood model, although we're, let's admit it, we're in a highly speculative area here. Oh yeah. As I we mean, say this. And everybody agrees that, that, that this is, I mean, this is the most precise study I've seen come out. Yes, but I, I would state uh, it's a study that completely and absolutely assumes evolution and uh, doesn't try and explain it. They have no Well, it does try to explain it, and it explains it by ghost pathways. Well. <laughs> maybe, the, it, maybe quantum uh, evolution. I mean, that. Uh, they assume their conclusion, their evolutionary conclusion here. Of course. I could go over there the data and go just the opposite direction, you know. <laughs> In fact, I could argue that you can go to the data and argue the opposite more easily. I think so, def definitely, in terms of these top-heavy ones. And, and the other thing is that he doesn't talk about is what do you do with things like ginkgo trees? where you have this diversity and disparity, as so, so to speak, at, uh, and then the thing dies out, and now then you have recent ones with no fossil ancestors in between. Call them Lazarus species. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, Dr. Downs, uh, when uh, he did his uh, research uh, years ago, was allowed into the uh, archives at the National Museum he came across all sorts of bones of larger animals from the same era, 
but the uh, museum refused to put them out because it didn't fit their uh, their uh, display of the little horses getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the, all the bones of the huge horses were hidden away where no one could see them. The second thing is there's an interesting... Uh, so you're suggesting that some of the data that we see here is actually already artificially culled right. to... Uh, uh, that the disparity may be even more than, 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 than right. what it shows here. Right. Second thing, there is uh, my daughter came across a uh, thing on the uh, computer yesterday called something like Forbidden Geology, and the premise was that evidently someone has come across some bones that appear to be human bones in one of these deep layers where humans should not have existed. You, you hear those reports every once in a while, and at least some of them seem to be pretty good reports, but of course, then what do you do with that? Uh, and, and as you can imagine, any report like that is going to be fought tooth and nail. Whether it should be fought or not is a different question. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you've got that. Now, the, the thing I think is fascinating is that these people are taking if I can call it that, the approved data, and showing that it still doesn't really fit evolutionary theory unless you have, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the evolutionary trees that have been sometimes produced, and then in the middle of the trunk or perhaps in one of the large branches there's a question mark, you know? Well, it looks like it looks like the question marks really belong there. Um, and in fact, if one were of a, uh, shall we say, skeptical bent, one could hypothesize that, this, that the question marks never were there in the first place. And you would certainly not be able to argue that from the fossil record. You would have to argue it from evolutionary theory. Maybe it's an upside down tree. Um, well, that's what Gould said, you know. Gould's model is upside down. So, yeah, it might be an upside down uh, uh, tree. Go ahead. I have a, a request. I would like to have you or Dr. Rolfe give me as a stupid... <laughs> Person. Uh, I don't think stupid well, as qualifies, an uninformed. But yes, okay, that one I'll, I'll a, grant. A model, the geologic layers, and a how we as creationists explain this. Okay, I'm going to give you a short model. Oh, will that be if, enough? I, I, don't know if, I don't know if, well, for one thing, we don't know enough to develop a... a uh, detailed, complicated model. But what I would suggest is that if you were thinking of a flood coming in, it would sweep over areas of the continent, whichever continent it happens to be, and it would then take everything that's in that area and kind of mix it up somewhat, allow some of it to settle so that in general, for animals, which is what I'm, what I'm particularly interested in here, so that the smaller animals and the denser animals, which would generally be amphibians and then reptiles and then birds and mammals more or less at the same time. In fact, the birds probably later than the mammals. They fly away. Well, no, it's not just that they fly away. It is also that even if they, uh, that just if you put their bodies in water, and this has actually been done and published in Origins, um, that the amphibians generally are denser and sink faster than the reptiles, which sink faster than the birds and mammals. Birds come last. Uh, do you know of where the uh, where you first find mammals and mammal-like reptiles in the geologic column? Triassic. 
Okay, and the birds are first found, if I remember right, in the Jurassic, which is later. Right. Just right so it there. actually fits. So the, the flood is responsible for the whole geological column. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. <coughs> Certainly, there, there's some debate after the uh, tertiary, and one of the things we're going to try to do is to try to solve that problem. And one of the kind of quick and dirty ways of solving it is to do some uh, carbon-14 dating, which is unfortunately we've run into roadblocks trying to get that done. Um, but one of these days we'll figure out how to do it. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we may be approaching the time when that kind of thing can be done. Um, but I can't say too much more about that right now because I don't want to expose some people to, uh, 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 shall we say, employment retribution. Um, but, uh, but it would be interesting to see whether carbon-14 dates for, let's say, the, uh, 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 let's say, the Eocene or the or where, where they really start taking off because from a creationist standpoint, you expect carbon-14 to be rising immediately after the flood um, at a somewhat defined rate. And so we can find out, for example, whether the Green River formation is actually post-flood or is actually the tail end of flood deposits. Mm -hmm. And we're not really sure on that. And there are people who argue both ways. Um, I mean, one of the problems that we have is, you know, the dinosaurs, it makes sense to make them flood. But now what do we do with no dinosaurs after that uh, and with birds and mammals? I mean, now, one thing you have to keep in mind is that this part of this could be simply <laughs> definition. If you find dinosaurs, they're Cretaceous or earlier. That's the definition of Cretaceous is it has dinosaurs, you know. And if you do that, of course, then the geologic column will always uh, be in order, at least for dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs were exterminated by the flood? There's some debate about that, too. I'm sorry. Uh, but here's the, I, don't, I don't feel badly about having models that don't really know for sure, because that suggests that you could have research on that. And the reason I say that, uh, that the dinosaurs may not have been uh, uh, exterminated by the flood is simply because if you read Beowulf, you get the very strong impression that there was a two-footed, uh, uh, large carnivore uh, dinosaur uh, with a large mouth but with very small front arms that were susceptible to being pulled off. And you're going to, well, all I can say is go back and read the story and uh, see if you don't come to the same conclusion. Uh, and there was another dinosaur which had wings and only two legs, which, of course, you, you remember the Chinese dragons all have four wings and, and uh, four legs and then also wings, which uh, doesn't fit any of the dinosaurs. But this is a description of a, uh, a dinosaur that had wings instead of legs, mm -hmm. which is much easier to see. Uh, and I can see there being not a lot of fossilization after the flood. And therefore, a few of these creatures could live, not get preserved, because there's, no, there's nothing to bury them. And if they do die, the rodents or whatever finish off their, uh, their bones eventually. I mean, think of it this way. How many uh, million buffalo did we once have, or uh, bison as the more proper name, in the uh, continental United States? And they're all gone. And yet, if you're driving across the plains, you can't find 
uh, bison uh, skeletons. Because, not because there weren't any, many of them got shot and they left, left to rot, but, you know, after the, after the sinews were gone, why, various creatures came by and ate the bones and the, they're gone. So, you, you know, the early naive first assumptions on what happens to animals, they don't get fossilized unless they get buried. And in fact, that all by itself is an argument for rapid water burial because you can't make a fossil. You certainly can't make masses and masses and masses of fossils. I mean, the dinosaurs over in uh, Wyoming, uh, in uh, Montana, you know, they're Hanson's Ranch. You know, you dig and every, you know, every two or three feet you get some more bones, right? Right. Most all your dinosaurs die off in the Cretaceous. There's no question there's an extinction there of dinosaurs. Yeah, but and, there could and it's be a water burial. Or it's a, or if it's not a water burial, it's got to be a wind burial, and if there are rocks in there, the wind's not going to blow them in. Yeah, that, that's where they disappear. But you can postulate exceptions, of course. But, but we have to deal with the, the major group of them die. The major the group of them died and got buried by water. In the, Cretaceous, in the Cretaceous. And well, if they before. didn't get buried by water, if, they, if this was you know, millions of years of slow deposition, the worms would have got them. I would and, uh, think about how do you bury stuff and then <clears> think about if you bury it very, very slowly, how long does it last? <laughs> The answer is not very long. Certainly not very long in... Uh, uh, I mean, there, there are whales that are sitting down at the bottom of the ocean. And we've gone down and photographed them, and you can watch them over two or three years. They're just disappearing. And certainly, you know, you know if, you're, if you're depositing, let's say, a centimeter every thousand years, that's just not going to cut it. Right. <laughs> Paul? Yes. I, I just would add to uh, her question, which is an extremely important one, which uh, to me is that and radiometric dating are the most significant challenges to creation. But in uh, the model, the biblical model, implicit in that is the fact that you have to have a place for your dinosaurs to exist, uh, as well as a variety of other organisms that don't exist now. And you had to have an ecology that accommodated those plants, various plants that don't exist now. Uh, our, our Flora and fauna now is relatively poor to compared to everything that's in the fossil record. Uh, and uh, so you could postulate a different ecology. On the other hand, uh, there are some factors that strongly support the idea that uh, if you accommodate those like uh, the age of dinosaurs, uh, marine material, uh, there's data that strongly supports the idea that uh, it's the sequence of the fossils, uh, or I should say that supports the idea that the sequence of the fossils uh, reflects the way organisms live. For instance, uh, you find first microorganisms in the fossil record, and uh, evolutionists say, of course, that's first life. Then you find marine organisms uh, clearing to the Silurian from Cambrian Ordovician uh, uh, on up to Silurian, it's all marine. Then all of a sudden you get into terrestrial stuff and you don't find any terrestrial stuff below that. Uh, and then you get into uh, Jurassic, so the dinosaur areas, and then the mammals come higher up, although you have mammals down in the Triassic. 
uh, so it's, it's not a clear picture. But if you postulate that before the flood, uh, microorganisms lived in the ground before, uh, below the oceans, uh, and then there were the oceans, the next step up. Uh, there were land organisms at possibly a warmer climate than now, although they didn't have gasoline engines there to pollute the air. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> And then, uh, in the cooler regions, the mammals uh, lived higher up, and so on. And uh, you bury that, you're going to get your fossil record as we see it now. Yeah. There is one uh, other thing that I think goes in before we take our next question, and that is that before the flood, if you read the, if you read the record, there appears to be a river of life that comes out and then divides into four rivers. That's not natural according to the way things work. On the other hand, if you're a creator who is designing a, a, a landmass, it's a perfectly logical way of making sure that everything gets, wet, gets watered. So what we had before apparently was closer to a garden than it was to a rainforest. That is to say, it was designed to take water everywhere, and that raises the question of whether you had literally, before the flood, a Jurassic Park, where you could go and see the dinosaurs if you wanted to, and then, and, and they had their own flora and fauna that went with them. Interestingly, when the flood happened, the dinosaurs got separated from a good share of their of flora. Uh, one of the things that's odd is that, is that where you find these masses of dinosaur bones, you don't find masses of trees that they ate. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a major problem for the Morrison Formation, which... Uh, is admitted many times in the literature and try and excused. What do they all eat? Is that you can hardly find any plants in the Morrison. You can find some in places, but the dinosaurs aren't where the plants are. And Morrison is a huge thing, a hundred, well, a million kilometers, 400,000 square miles. Uh, and a million uh, square kilometers, but that's a thousand kilometers by a thousand kilometers. That's a good piece of land, yes. It's so, a good piece of land. Uh, <laughs> So uh, there's some striking data that does support ecological donation, but it's also uh, used as one of the strongest arguments, and I feel one of the most valid arguments they use for evolution is that organisms are simpler down below and they're more complicated as you go up. And if you buried our present earth, you'd get exactly the same thing. We have all kinds of organisms, simple organisms living in the ground, and our oceans are below land, uh, and our most advanced organisms are on land. So well, you, before we leave that, mm -hmm. though, I, w I, I want to challenge that a little bit. You can make that case for vertebrates. You can't make that case for invertebrates very well. The first trilobites are every bit as complex right, as anything that right comes. Right, for that. But... but uh, what is presented in textbooks and everywhere else is very rare. People, you know, kids love dinosaurs, and that's, they think that's the whole world. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more uh, to that. But, but, I mean, but, but ammonites those, don't evolve, right? But, but those invertebrates just appear all of a sudden, and folks, one of the strongest evidence for the ecological explanation for the flood is the Cambrian explosion. All of a sudden, you've got all these marine organisms, just as you'd expect uh, for the lowest seas before the flood. Uh, and they're mostly bottom dwellers to back there. Why not? Yeah. Anyway. There's uh, some interesting uh, reports from uh, even recent times of strange creatures that they found in Africa that... Uh, certainly mimic the, uh, 
the appearance of a uh, dinosaur from what uh, the uh, African uh, uh, in individuals uh, were describing in their uh, uh, kind of their folk folk uh, folklore. Uh, you know, the the problem with using that as an argument, it's great if, if we ever find them. It's going to be a wonderful argument. If we don't find them, then I like to steer clear of things that look like somebody could argue their vaporware. You know, for one thing, I think it's fair to pound the other guys for having vaporware. Well, that means that we need to be careful about using arguments that could be vaporware. I, I agree with you. I think that... Um, I think that until you until you have either physical evidence, or in the case of Beowulf, that's literary evidence that's been around for. I, I mean, we have manuscripts that go back way before dinosaurs were ever popular. And so that one, I'll, that one I'll, I'll say that's pretty good evidence. But uh, I mean, it, I've seen reports of humans. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that when Ellen White was around, the papers were full of discovery of six foot, seven foot, eight foot uh, humans in North America. Uh, and they have disappeared from the record. But if you know how to Google, you can find them. And the the old papers from way back when, and they'll have photographs of these things, and that, it's amazing. Uh, and so, well, I think that uh, it's probably true uh, that there are not a lot of these things. I think some of them have been figuratively buried because they don't fit the standard paradigm. Yes, and okay. then over here. I have a question on the radiometric uh, dating systems. How do they isolate? Uh, there's different infiltrates that have m maybe got in, gotten into the specimen, and they're analyzing that rather than the integrity of the material itself that they're they're trying to date. You, you following what I'm saying? Yes. It's been uh, in a sediment layer for for ages, and it all these things have leached in to the to the product. And <laughs> is that a that is a that is a an argument that was used to explain away a mosasaur that dated at I think it was twenty four thousand radiocarbon years, which is about point I remember right is uh, is actually one uh, it's actually two percent of the modern carbon level or something like that I. I'd have to look up the exact numbers, but it it's it was pretty amazing. Um, you know, they got carbon for you know, you've heard about all of the the dinosaur tissue that's been uh, found. Well, this is the only thing in the literature where they actually had the temerity to do the carbon fourteen date. And the date we got was one that was uh, well above background levels. And what they said was, oh, well, that's stuff that had gotten leached in, so to speak. So, yes, uh, that's a possibility. But you know what? The other side is actually the one that has having to use that desperately to explain why carbon-14 dates aren't what they are. Um, first one is uh, the motion patch or the large the head. Formation. Right. Right. Yeah. I think the dinosaurs all died because they ate up all the foliage, so there was nothing <laughs> to it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I love but, that. <laughs> yes, but um, you know, you, you um, look at the nostrils of the dinosaurs. The the opening is so small. Uh, in this atmosphere, um, the it could not support that huge structure. <laughs> I believe. I mean, if that makes any sense to you. Uh, yeah. It, it does. Opening, yeah. In those days, the pressure yeah, of oxygen was higher. Yeah, you have a higher. head that's like this big, and you have a body that's yes, several that's tons. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And yes. And, yes. And, and, well, it also raises the question of how in the world did he get enough food? 
There you are. Right. Now, but, to be fair, these are reptiles and not mammals. And so their general uh, metabolic rate is going to be less than you might expect for a mammal. And so reptiles uh, don't stress their... Um, don't stress the, the, their, their system quite as much okay. as would, mm. would mammals. So, you know, kind of slow thing that, that can react quickly at times, but is most of the time just not really moving very fast, is a little easier to believe. But I agree with you that, the, you know, there's, there's, there's secular scientists who insist that the, that the atmosphere was denser back then. Was, was higher, right. And the closest we come to seeing a dinosaur-like creature was in 1974-ish, where the Japanese fishermen caught this huge reptile, and they took a picture that went all over the world. Yeah, and you can still And then they it. let it go. You probably have seen that picture somewhere. Did you? Well, they also yes, pulled, it was they also pulled up a dead one. Yes, that the, the dead, dead, dead one and, and the dead carcass. And then they took pictures and they let it go. But that fits the picture of the dinosaurs I've seen. Uh, you know, saying that thing wasn't a plesiosaur or something like that is kind of probably stretching it. And that raises a whole interesting question of what happened to all those things during that fossilization period. If, if, if that is confirmed, basically that turns the plesiosaur into a Lazarus species. We've gone to Loch Ness here. You what? We've gone to Loch Ness <laughs> to talk <laughs> about the they, monsters. They have photographs of two Loch Ness monsters at yeah. the same time. Well... There, there should be, there should be, actually you need daddy but if there's there. A, yeah, but if there's mom and daughter, you need papa. There's a daddy somewhere. <laughs> Maybe the daddy monsters are a lot smaller and, and, easy, and, and shyer, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> but, uh, National, National Geographic. Yeah, that's, uh, okay, here. I think it was National Geographic that went and that combed the whole place, the whole um, the lake, lake kind of. you know, and this is, there is no way the ecosystem that's there could support any large creature like this. I have no idea. But well, that's again, what they claim. Again, this is assuming There are that photographs. There, These are photographs. There, this is assuming that they live like mammals do. And the one thing to keep in mind is that reptiles uh, are mostly, uh, uh, they get their uh, energy from glycogen, uh, from, from uh, uh, glycolysis, not from uh, actually respiration. And, and because of that, they can, be, they can go into a stage of torpor quite easily. And so I'm, I'm, I'm cautious about saying, oh, they know for sure it doesn't exist. I, when we catch one, we'll, we'll know for sure. Until then, it's kind of, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. But again, if I'm, if I'm making my arguments, I don't like to use those because it's too easy to write them off as vaporware. Anyway, you got the photos. It, Oh, okay. Do you want to describe them a little bit? Googleimages.com. <laughs> um, just type in Japanese uh, dinosaur Japanese fishing boat, and you'll find all sorts of pictures. Um, so this is, you know, high resolution pictures. It's clearly a vertebrate, but. Um, it is a very uh, degraded uh, animal, dead animal that's been dead for quite some time and looks like stuff has been non, sort of gnawing away at it. Um, the, the thing that really stands out about it is that um, it seems to have a pretty long neck and sort of small head, 
but the head is such that you can't really make out any features, you can't really make out any jaw or whatnot. It's just sort of massive, macerated uh, flesh, sort of. Um, so it's, it's a little hard to tell. It does sort of look like a plesiosaur in terms of like the lengths of its limbs. Its neck seems to be a lot shorter than a plesiosaur, but still a pretty long, pretty long neck. So um, I think I read about this before somewhere else where it's thought there's something called a, I think a baleen shark or something like that, that apparently has a spine that goes out to its nose. Uh, and there's maybe thoughts that it's uh, maybe a really big mouth uh, and thoughts that maybe this is a well-known shark or fish of some type. I don't know. Yeah, the, 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 the sad part is it would have been nice to have taken out a couple of chunks and we could do DNA analysis on it. Yeah. That would be fascinating. Um, but again, uh, the... the I, I would propose that one of the things you expect from flood model is A, barrel shapes, with a lot of disparity at the beginning, a lot of disparity at the end, uh, with you know some tapering at the top, maybe a little tapering at the bottom, although uh, a creationist model has no problem at all with, with the sudden appearance. Whereas an evolutionary model just has to have these ghost pathways that go down to the single ancestor. Um, I would expect some inverted models of the flood where uh, conditions are more rigorous. Uh, a lot of organisms don't survive now compared to the past. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the thing to keep in mind is that if you take, if we were to have another flood, if you think of it that way, there are you know distributions that would happen that uh, that would that would give you a an entirely different picture than than an evolutionary model, and most importantly, those that picture, according to this article, happens to fit most of the data. And that's, that's the thing I think I would, if I would leave you with anything is that this proves that the standard evolutionary model doesn't fit the data and the data has to be force fed into it. Whereas a creationist model has really not that much trouble. Sudden onset, diverse onset, Sometimes sudden disappearance, sometimes not. But in general, not branching as much as you might expect otherwise. I, th I think it is a little bit easier to fit uh, the mass extinctions into um, a flood model than uh, otherwise, but... Uh, oh, yeah. That is not, that is speculation. Anyway, next week we'll be looking at uh, counting to God. Uh, and I think that uh, it would be interesting and useful to go over it. It will also be interesting and useful to think beyond it. So, you know, ask questions as, you know, where they would differ from a short-age creationist. What would you do with it? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and think about areas where uh, where um, either this guy's difference from the standard model suggests testable ways of de determining the difference between the two, or where his his difference from 
Short age creationism suggests testable uh, ways of distinguishing between the two, because I'm I'm a I'm a believer in the scientific method, if not perhaps the uh, uh, the results of the certain, uh, current scientific consensus. I think that uh, that it actually is worth our while to go and check things out. With that, I will. See you next week.